My name is Julian Willard. And I'm Jim Mack, and this is Pineal Express, where trains of thought intersect. If you like Pineal Express, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash pineal express. At various levels of support, our patrons receive extra episodes of the show and other bonus content. John Ayatarola is a host and producer at the Young Turks, also known as TYT, which is a multiple award-winning and widely viewed giant of online news and political commentary. John has a background in political science, a discipline that serves to inform his news analysis. John's vantage point at TYT, including on his show The Damage Report, grants him a valuable perspective on trends in American politics and media. So we asked John to come on to Pineal Express and detail some of these trends. Our discussion covers how to influence voters' behavior and attitudes. Relatedly, it also covers how to understand the shape of American political media in light of an increasingly fast-paced news cycle and ongoing Trump administration malfeasance. So without further delay, welcome, John Iadarola. Thank you. Very glad to be here. John, I've seen you and other TYT hosts emphasize the importance of progressives turning out to vote. And I notice millennials, the most progressive generation, tend to have abysmal voter turnout numbers. And that's above and beyond what can be accounted for by just their relatively young age. Um, Now, we're all millennials in this conversation, and I know TYT has a large millennial audience. So from your vantage point, why do you think millennials don't vote at higher rates? It is incredibly frustrating. Um, I, I, look, I, I'm not an expert on that. I will admit that. But I, but I do think there are some reasons. I mean, as you alluded to, historically, young people do tend to vote at lower rates. I also think that to the extent that any particular period in politics provides sort of natural inroads for people to to feel not only like there's a reason for them to pay attention, like the issues that are being talked about actually matter to them, but also that their participation could actually matter. I, I don't know that we're really at an awesome period for that. I think that politics in general seems so, with the theatrics of Donald Trump, it seems so separate from actual concerns of real people, especially young people. Like when was the last time you heard like, you know, student loan debt talked about or something like that? And then at the same time, I think a lot of people, not just young people, but people throughout the spectrum feel like there's so much money in politics. It doesn't feel like if they were to be involved, it necessarily would would matter. I I don't think that that's actually true. I think that it does matter. But I think it's very easy for people to feel like like that their participation wouldn't matter. So, you know, why go to all the trouble of spending your time and your you know, mental health by tracking the day to day, you know, evolution of these politics that just seems so, so dirty and so pointless. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me, John. And and one of the things I think that contributes to the sense of politics not mattering, particularly among millennials, is what millennials notice about the structure of government itself and how undemocratic that structure is. So my next question concerns that The TYT Network, including your show The Damage Report, for instance, has been very good about highlighting just how anti-democratic our government structure is fundamentally. Uh, For example, how the Senate and the Electoral College guarantee disproportionate representation of rural whites, as the founders hoped those institutions would, and how the courts seem poised to continue to uphold voter disenfranchisement, particularly against Democratic Party voters. So in light of these problems, what's the best strategy in your estimation for the progressive left to overcome the major structural disadvantages imposed by our system of government itself? That's a good question. Um, First, we should acknowledge how difficult it is because many of the sort of structural designed inequalities, like, for instance, you, you mentioned, you know, the fact that the Senate, you know, California has 160th representation per person than Utah, something like that. Um, if you even talk about the possibility of changing something like that, you are painted as an extremist. I mean, hell, if you talk about stopping gerrymandering, they, they act like you're a radical, let alone if you want to you know, change the composition or you know, term length of Supreme Court justices, or if you want to change the Electoral College. I mean, any of those, you will be attacked as being outside of the mainstream, far, far outside of the mainstream. I, I do think that those conversations still need to happen, though. And I think that there are some great ideas, especially... Uh, During the the nomination hearing for now Justice Brett Kavanaugh, the the conversations that were going on about what it might look like if we were to have term limits on the Supreme Court, I I think those are very interesting ideas I'd like to see discussed more. I mean, at the end of the day, hypothetically, if we did have amazing turnout, we could drastically reduce, I I guess, the ability of some of these designed inequalities to, to shape political outcomes. Like if we just voted at insane rates and we supported progressive you know, candidates, 
we could make some of those things matter less. But I do think that those structural conversations do need to happen. It's a little bit frustrating, for instance, that uh, in the wake of the 2016 election, when once again, you know, the Electoral College had delivered a, a totally different outcome than, you know, something in a pure democracy you'd expect, we were talking about, you know, maybe we should change the Electoral College. And what, what happened is what always happens. They say, oh, you're just sore losers. You're only saying this because you lost. You can't talk about it in the wake of an election. So then a little bit of time goes by. And now if you bring it up, no one still wants to talk about it. They say, ah, what's the difference? You know, maybe we'll get them next time. And so there's really no time when you're allowed to have a productive conversation about something major like changing the Electoral College or the distribution of senators or, you know, any anything like that. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. It also seems to me that there is a kind of founding father worship, you know, that we have in this country uh, and that we're taught in our schools, uh, which is not to denigrate the achievements of the founding fathers, but it is to say that there is kind of an idea that they were infallible in constructing a certain system of government. And that's clearly wrong, you know, given, given that we've had, you know, multiple constitutional crises and a civil war in our history. I don't think they uh, were so flawless as oftentimes we're taught in school. Yeah, exactly. Um yeah, and like it, people people point out that George Lucas had to make, you know, several rounds of changes to Star Wars. Well, how many amendments have we made to the Constitution? And more that we need to, some that were debated and weren't passed that would have been awesome. I mean, look, they, they obviously created something that at the time certainly stood out. It has stood the test of time, but only thanks to continuing evolution work of activists and politicians and regular people all along the way. And as you say, even then, it's led to wars and, you know, major, you know, major issues, both economically, socially, culturally, all of that. Um, so what they did was great. But the idea that we shouldn't question any of it, I mean, that's insane. First of all, we can point out, as we have been, you know, in this podcast, some major changes that, that are needed. But this would just, again, be in a long history of necessary, constant conversation about the Constitution, major changes. Um like hell, like, you know, the the popular election of senators, like the founding fathers thought that that was a bad idea. Like we, we are used to questioning these things. And I think we need to continue to. So you recently interviewed political scientist Mark Hetherington on left right political divisions. What stuck out to me was his description of fundamental values that divide the left and right that the right tends to value traditional forms of punishment, obedience, and skepticism of outsiders, and the left, which tends to favor openness and curiosity of ideas. My question then is, in your view, if there is such a fundamental divide, doesn't that make it impractical to try and change the minds of partisan voters who already disagree with you? Uh, maybe. I, I mean, what he's describing, I think, is generally true and generally supported by a lot of research going back decades. I mean, you know, people like George Lakoff and the World Values Survey and things like that show that these are things that exist not just now and not just in the U.S., but internationally. You can find these sorts of uh, uh, sort of distinct value systems generally in opposition to each other. Sometimes the contours are a little bit different in different countries, you know, the effect of culture and religion and all of that. But you do tend to find sort of similar clusters. But that doesn't mean that that, that persuasion doesn't matter. And, and these things exist across a spectrum. Like there are people who believe in, you know, some form of deference to authority, but that can come in many different forms, I think. That can be, you know, sort of a slight thing, or it can be like, you know, with the white nationalists that we see sort of taking over the right now. Um, it can be a very strong sort of unifying principle that the rest of their political uh, beliefs are sort of organized around. But I think that a lot of people, even in the best of times, like we exist in sort of a bubble, those of us, whether on the left or the right, who all day long we're paying attention to politics, that's what we think about. I mean, a gigantic chunk of the population does have a value system. You know, they have values that political principles could be hung on, but they don't think about it all the time. And so I think that depending on the current state of the country, you know, which politicians we put forward, which narratives we pursue, I think that those people can be activated or not activated. They can. I think that there are people who can be persuaded. I think that the idea that you're going to get Tucker Carlson to suddenly switch over seems ridiculous, but I think that we don't need to. I think that there are a lot of reasonable people in the middle that hypothetically from one election to another could be persuaded. Right. So my next question, uh, you know, the quote, intellectual dark web, which includes people <laughs> such as Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, Ben Shapiro, are big in the new media and to an extent also in the mainstream media. Since you're in political media yourself, I'm curious about your general thoughts on the impact the intellectual dark web is having on political discourse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God. 
I hate that term so much. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So first of all, yes, I'm in political media, but I'm in political media on the left, so I'm irrelevant. That We should just acknowledge that. <laughs> if you are in any way a leftist, whether center left or far left, like nobody cares. <laughs> um, but the New York Times, I mean, God, if you are a white supremacist or a neo-Nazi or, you know, something approaching it, like the New York Times is just busting down your door to do a profile. And uh, so, look, I think, I think, is it Barry Weiss that's sort of most responsible for that term? Yep. Like, you have people like that that are just, like, they're not, tech. like, if you look on their card or you look on their LinkedIn, it doesn't say that they do public relations, but they are desperately trying to do public relations for these people. And so... Like that group that you mentioned, they have been very, very good at branding. That is their skill. Like Donald Trump, they are very good at telling you what you should think about them and then damn the evidence that's who they are. Like they will say, you know, they will say with their last dying breath that they are in favor of free speech and big ideas and, you know, all of this thing. And then, you know, they go on each other's shows and they generally agree on 90% of everything. Uh, if they ever talk to anyone who disagrees, it is a shouting debate that accomplishes absolutely nothing. It is a gigantic farce, the intellectual dark web. And I feel a little bit embarrassed that back in my younger days, back in college, I used to read Sam Harris and things like that back when I was a little bit more naive and a little bit worse of a critical thinker. Us too. Oh, yeah. And look, some of, some of his stuff isn't terrible. I think he gets a little bit crazy when he goes into all the you know, the the psychedelics and stuff like that. But and the meditation's interesting. Um, but many of them, like, look, Ben Shapiro, he's developed this brand of being a reasonable conservative. But no, like, look at his look at his history of comments about race and, and gender and sexuality. Like, he is just a slightly better branded far right extremist pundit. That's what he is. But he goes under this new umbrella with the rest of them, some of which I'm, I'm not like, I'm, I'm honestly not that familiar with Jordan Peterson and his work because I'm trying to maintain the last vestiges of my mental health. Um, but they're very good at branding themselves. Well, John, you could not have any more perfectly segued into my next question, which is that I want to ask a little bit more about those differences in journalistic standards and work ethic in right media versus left media. Uh, it seems like right wing media figures can acquire as as you alluded to, a large following and financial success, even when they provide shallow analysis or get sloppy with the facts or make stuff up or otherwise razzle dazzle their audience with a kind of bombastic kayfabe, I notice. And yet, as you <laughs> must know better than most people in left media, you have to work extremely hard, fact check everything, do deep contextual analysis and become a near expert across academic disciplines just to stay viable. So I'm curious to know, what has your experience personally been like being on one side of that asymmetry? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, first of all, I, I'm going to disagree slightly. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's independent media on both sides. And, and hypothetically, you could, you, on the left, you could probably get some sort of audience if you say, you know, extreme things and stuff like that and and don't necessarily subscribe to journalistic ethics. I think that it's probably harder and far more rare. But but then you also have a different version of that where, so I work at the Young Turks. I do not have a background in journalism. My background is in political science, political psychology. Um, like Jenk is a former lawyer. Anna at, at the Young Turks does come from a journalistic background, but we have, we have lawyers and, you know, we have some reporters, we have comedians, we have all sorts of different people. So I don't have any sort of formalized training in journalism or, you know, interviewing or, or any of these sorts of things. But what I do try to do is be ethical. I, I do try to care about whether what I'm saying is true. I try to expose myself to multiple, you know, sources of information. I try to question the things I believe. So I think that you can, that can stand in for the formalized training that, that doesn't necessarily on things like CNN or MSNBC really lead to better results anyway. Now, as you alluded to on the right, though, you don't have any of that stuff. So they're not, they don't have training in journalism, uh, which shouldn't surprise us since they hate and fear journalists. But they also don't, they don't have enough respect for the truth or for their audiences to care if what they're saying is true. And honestly, I don't know why they would. They have no incentive to do so. Uh, on the right, I think the one thing that I have a bit of sympathy for them on is if you say anything reasonable, if you question Trump on something, if you do any of that, they hate your guts. My God, like Chris Wallace, I think, said something that questioned Donald Trump. 
And there were people like Fox News viewers calling for him to be thrown off the air. Like, so they have to be extreme. They have to always be looking for the next crazy white genocide conspiracy theory or South African farmers or the caravan or God knows what. And they're paid very well to do it, whether they get an audience or not. And generally they can because there's there's a lot of crazies in this country. They're going to be supported by billionaires and things like that. People like Charlie Kirk are going to be given a career and given a platform and stuff like that. Um so really, I, I think that it comes down to the incentives provided by the audience, the incentives provided by the people who fund them. Um, I, I don't think that we can really be surprised that that they don't care if what they're saying is true. They're there to score points. They're there to generate headlines that they destroyed or eviscerated someone, um, when really all they're eviscerating is you know our attachment to objective reality. And spe- so speaking generally of journalism... Um, One thing that you in particular, John, do a great job of is contextualizing the day-to-day activities of the Trump administration within the larger framework of Republican corruption, their abuses of power, and erosion of democratic norms. Uh, So my question is, how do you manage to keep track of all this Trump-era malfeasance when the examples of such occur near daily and are too numerous even to detail in a concise Mm. way? Uh, I don't. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I try to. I certainly try to. Um, you know, we have a couple of segments on the damage report where occasionally we check in on, hey, remember that gigantic story that happened last week that nobody remembers? So I, I do try to do that. But but even so, I, I have to move on at some point. Like we did in the wake of uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, that shooting, we did coverage of that for weeks and weeks. And uh, I remember reporting on, I think... Um, I think Media Matters had done a, a media analysis of the drop off in conversation about it on the different networks. And you know, we kept going for a while because I felt like it was important to do so. But eventually we did move on. And uh, you know, we were doing round the clock daily coverage of the Kavanaugh hearings. And we kept digging at it. We kept digging at it. But eventually we did move on. And the thing is, there are these like the, the, the Trump, uh, the, the tax story that broke a couple of weeks ago, like these things like I try to draw attention to them and I try to stick around longer than other people do but but you are you're punched in the face with a new story every day at least one if not more um and so basically I'm just I'm trying to do my best and and one of the ways that I that I try to do that is not just you know not just talking about it myself or whatever but you know we try to bring in people to the show that are affected by these issues we try to come at the stories from different angles we we have more of a respect i would say for expert opinion in terms of academics and authors and things like that than most of the media does anymore um so i i do disagree with the premise of your question because i don't do a good job of it but i do try to and is this phenomenon that you're talking about, about sort of getting punched in the face with the new daily breaking news, is your experience of this that that is a result of the news cycle being like actually faster? Or is it that the types of stories that are coming out, particularly about the Trump administration, just don't have legs because of a kind of saturation? Like, is it the speed of the news cycle or is it the content of the stories that are driving this inability to really keep up with everything? I think it's a combination of those things and a couple of other things. I, I think we have more media every day than the day we did, did you know, than the day before. Um, you know, if you're on Twitter, like you can find out about not just that you find out about the news faster, but you find out about more of the news. Like I follow enough journalists that I get every time Sarah Huckabee Sanders says something, every time you know Kellyanne Conway says something, every time Trump walks across the lawn and shouts something at a reporter, I'm going to see that quote, and so. You're definitely saturated with more stuff. But I think on top of that, Donald Trump is doing a lot of really bad stuff. I think that Obama, by contrast, was a boring president in that he didn't say so many crazy things. He didn't pursue so many horrific policies. I think I think a better comparison might be to the last Republican president. If I'm looking for, you know, a a politician who's doing something daily that's terrible and I do remember those years, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't covering politics at that point, so it's difficult for me to know. And also, the news environment was very different back then. We didn't have Twitter. So I think that it's a combination of both. He's very good at drawing news coverage for the things he says. He says objectively horrible things. And he's very good at trying to just, dis- I hate to call it distractions because the issues are so important, but like today, he came out with uh, his new thing where they're going to try to define out of existence trans- the transgender identity. So horrible, yeah. And so 
it, on the one hand, he's using that to try to distract people. On the other hand, I care about that community, and so I want to talk about that. So you're really putting a bind on a daily basis. Sticking to this topic a little bit, I notice there has been a fast rehabilitation rate in corporate media for conservatives who once advanced horrific policies, but who centrists think now look good in comparison to Trump. For example, mainstream media seems far too kind to George W. Bush, David Frum, Rick Santorum, and Bill Kristol. Is there any degree of wrongness a political figure's domestic and foreign policy predictions can be before cable news will think twice about giving them a political analyst job? And do you (laughs) think in five or so years, cable news, even besides Fox, will hire the worst of the present day Trump administration officials as analysts? I think they might do that now. (laughs) I mean, I'm surprised Sean Spicer isn't doing commentary or, you know, Scaramucci or something. Um, Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I do think that, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I guess, the, is there anyone in the Trump administration that could not be rehabilitated? That is an interesting question. Is Zinke going to be on CNN? I don't know. Um, I agree with you that there is a sort of forgetting of history when it comes to some of these Republicans. I, I'm really of two minds on it, though. Like, like someone, like, there's definitely, there are cutoff points. Like, for me, Bill Crystal, I don't give a damn what Bill Crystal thinks about anything. And, and I guess that David Frum should should probably be lumped in there, too. It's difficult because for me, wanting to sort of cite or signal boost to some extent what some of these people are saying, I am in no way trying to say that they are good people. It, it's very much a sort of pragmatic, I want to bring up these examples to hopefully remind some Republicans that I guess we don't have to be as horrifically cruel, but 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 I, I mean, it is a good point to say that they pursued some of the the worst military strategies leading to hundreds of thousands of deaths. So are they really examples of anything better? Yeah, I, it's complicated. I, I hate the the whitewashing of George W. Bush's record in particular because, you know, he was really the sort of the nexus point for so many of these absolutely horrific policies. He was just better at cloaking it in, you know, what at the time they called compassionate conservatism. It's difficult because I, I hate so much what's going on right now. And I really want to take any strategy that, that I think could lead to a stepping back of the Republican Party from sort of the ledge that they have found themselves on, I think is good. But you are right. If we rehabilitate those people too easily or too fully, that that becomes a problem. One thing I do want to say, though, is I think that there is that criticism sometimes goes a bit too far when... Like, for instance, if John McCain, back when he was alive, he would say something critical of Donald Trump or, you know, Bob Corker or Jeff Flake or something like that. If you say anything positive about them criticizing Donald Trump, it's very popular these days to say, oh, look at the next member of the resistance or something like that. And I do think we should be willing to accept allies when possible. Like their their allyship might not be worth much. Like Bob Corker, you know, Jeff Flake, Jeff Flake, especially after the Kavanaugh hearings. His criticism of Donald Trump doesn't necessarily accomplish anything, but I don't want to provide a disincentive to Republicans to speak out. I think that when they say something against Trump and we immediately bury them, I think that that sends the message to Republicans that there's no point. You know, why go against the president when it's going to hurt you on the right anyway, if the left is also going to destroy you? And so I think with some people, you know, from, as you pointed out, George W. Bush, stuff like that, Rumsfeld, if he ever pops his head up. There's no point in, in really taking them seriously because they're, they're so objectively horrible. But I think there are some Republicans that we should be willing to accept as at least contingent temporary allies. One thing I do find hopeful about fighting government corruption is that there have been some major politicians lately who have rejected the corrupting influence of corporate PAC money, favoring grassroots donations instead. Bernie Sanders and Beto O'Rourke come to mind. However, it's not clear to me how well that grassroots fundraising model can apply in smaller races, like for House seats or state assembly races. Uh, In your estimation, how far do you think small donor funded races can realistically scale and still produce viable candidates? Well, I'm glad that you brought up Beto because obviously the news broke, you know, like a week ago that he'd raised $38 million. Yeah, it's crazy. It might not be enough to get him over, you know, the, the top, but it is good. I think it's a good point to raise um, because those races are always going to get less media coverage. They're always going to be, you know, lower scale. I think the thing that would make it possible and and that I believe will make it possible is it has to be a non 
local focus. Like if there's a, you know, a state, especially when you go to like state government and things like that, how much news coverage are they are they generally historically going to get? This is going to be very little. And yet I can name at least a few, you know, especially in New York that have gotten a lot of, a lot of coverage. And that's thanks to organizations like Our Revolution, Justice Democrats. And then there's, there's other groups, some of which might even be more more centrist. But, you know, there's there's swing left and, you know, flip and you know, stuff like that. I think that if you have these national sort of political activist groups and media companies willing to focus on these congressional races, these state legislative races, and can direct people elsewhere to do small dollar donations, I think that then it can succeed. And I think that TYT especially, we have really tried, like we have done so many interviews of candidates, like even on the damage report, we do quite a few, not just congressional, but I've done a good number of state legislative interviews as well. The idea being that, you know, if you represent, you know, a couple of towns in northern New York, like there's only so many small dollar donations you're going to get. But if people who agree with your political ideology in California want to donate, then that I mean, there, there's some issues with that, hypothetically. I, philosophically, you could have an issue with that, but I much prefer that to, you know, them going for gigantic corporate dollars. So I do think that if we can help each other across the country, that might be enough to make it work. And and even that, like, that is a stopgap measure. Like, the small dollar donations are far preferable to gigantic donations from individuals and from corporations and corporate PACs and things like that. But ideally, I think a lot of people, and probably a growing number of people, want to get rid of that entire thing. Like, this is simply a better version of the current system, but what we'd like is getting money out of politics entirely, or at least some of us, especially at TYT. Great. Um, just to switch gears a little bit, I've heard you say on air that you get some pushback for having a pessimistic outlook while reporting the news. But it seems to me that if anybody has an overly optimistic view at this current moment, they really aren't paying attention. Nothing drives this point home to me more than the recent dire IPCC report warning of the danger climate change poses now and in the foreseeable future. So what do you think it will take for people to actually pay attention to climate change and demand much stronger action? Yeah, so I, I agree. Uh, like the the philosophy that led to the damage report was you wake up, you boot up, you know, the internet or whatever, and you're like, oh dear God, what's happening? Um, so look, there is a natural sort of pessimistic premise to that. The issue is in terms of getting people to stay invested, to stay tuned in, like you can only do pessimism so far, or you call it realism. You know, you can only be realistic for so long before people might get just so beaten down that they check out. I, I think a good number of people probably have checked out of politics over the past year and two thirds or so, or even longer, maybe maybe back during the, the primaries. Um, and so it's difficult. And the, the climate change issue, I think, is perhaps the best example of that. One of the things that really depresses me is that while I have tried, I think, I think it's fair. I, I, I hate anything braggy whatsoever, but I think that I probably cover climate change more than anyone else in online media. Uh, and, and that's a very conscious thing, not just covering it myself, but but trying to bring people on. And uh, I don't know if you know, but I did you know a documentary where you know, climate change in the Arctic, it was a big portion of that, that docuseries that I filmed. I try to get back to it time and time again, but I definitely don't do that because it's a, a, you know, a winner in terms of views or money. Like climate change video, like I could, we did a video about, you know, T.I. and Melania Trump that's going to get more views than the next 10 climate change videos I do. And that's depressing. And I've tried to find out why. And I think the issue is that it naturally is a sort of depressing thing, especially in a time when politicians seem so unwilling to do anything about it. And we feel as Americans, like we're taking it far less seriously than most other countries around the world are. It can be hard to get people to listen to it because they just feel like, what's the point? What I try to do is to stress not just the magnitude of the problem, but also the magnitude of the opportunity that we have. You know, there's things like, you know, back in the day, there was like the Apollo project and stuff like that. People trying to get the population to focus on this economic opportunity we have to develop new technologies and new you know forms of generation of energy and distribution of energy and things like that. So I, I try to do what I can to give people a little bit of, of hope that th this idea that taking climate change seriously is necessarily going to be damaging to the, the economy. I, I, I just I fundamentally don't accept that. I think that like doubling down on coal, that's a bad idea for the economy. Like instead we should be going towards solar and wind, these massively growing um, uh, industries. And we should make sure that uh, that America is at the, you know, sort of, sort of the forefront of that. And so I think that we have to, we have to be able to give people the facts about climate change. We have to make clear that they understand the threat 
posed and not just a threat, you know, 70 years in, in the future, a threat that is worse every day. But we also have to provide them with some sort of inroads to hope, some sort of reason to believe that if they stay attentive to this issue, if they vote based on this issue, that they will actually see returns and not just in the far future, that they can see some sort of benefit coming in the near term as well. Yeah, well, we definitely have noticed your extensive coverage of climate change issues as they arise, and we definitely Thank you. appreciate and applaud that. Um, I, I, and I think potentially, and let me know, let me know if I'm off base here, but it seems like your flexibility in doing that, even knowing that it's not perhaps best for, for views is because you're independent media at TYT. I mean, I've often heard other figures who care deeply about climate change talk about how difficult it is to cover it in the cable news space. Like Chris Hayes, for instance, has mentioned that it's just very, very difficult given the pressures of corporate news to cover climate change. And he, and he, Which is not to say he doesn't cover it, because he absolutely does. But I'm curious to know sort of your experience with flexibility in covering important issues at TYT, even going into it, knowing that it might not get as much attention as something that's perhaps more celebrity focused, like you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I think I remember seeing him tweet about that, actually. And uh, you know, it's funny, because I uh, I don't watch much cable news. Um, and I, and I, I, I never really watch Chris Hayes, even though like, I understand that for all of the criticism that most people like at MSNBC get for not focusing on certain issues, like I do know objectively that he does talk about you know Syria and climate change and these sorts of issues. So I want to give him credit for that, even if I don't actually watch. Um, yeah, it's probably made more easy by, by a couple of different things. One, that this is an issue that the network as a whole does care about. And so they are supportive of covering it, even if it doesn't bring in uh, money. I think that also our format makes it a little bit easier in that like if I watch an episode of Rachel Maddow she might only talk about like two things like she'll go she'll go really in depth and she'll provide a lot of information and all of that but like we try to cover like on the damage report we generally try to cover seven topics a day the main show is similar like probably five or six topics per hour and obviously you can't go as in depth but we try to provide a lot of information while touching on many different issues so for me i can i can do a, a climate change story without thinking oh this has blown my entire friday show you know in terms of blocks or something like that so i think that our sort of more casual podcasty type format makes it a little bit more easy to touch base with you know, if we want to talk about lead poisoning and a shooting and climate change and what Trump has said, you know, we can do all of that in one hour. And so that sort of flexibility, not just in terms of our company, but in terms of our format, makes it a little bit easier. But also, I mean, you have to have a little bit of personal flexibility. Like I, I've said many times that when I left academia to come work for TYT, I did not come to enter the media industry. I came to work for TYT. That was it. I didn't I didn't think, you know, okay, I'm going to do this for two years, and then I'm going to move over to this network, and then I'm going to be on CNN. And I have long ago given up on having any real influence or fame or money or anything like that. So once you release that sort of thing mentally, it becomes a lot easier to just focus on the things you actually care about. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, so in contrast to some of the pessimistic framing that we've been using in our questions, given that these are pessimistic times, uh, I'm curious to know what gives you hope? What political trends are you noticing that seem to be promising the potential for something better? Well, there's a few things. I mean, we talked about Better O'Rourke's fundraising, and, and we've seen that in a, in a number of different uh, races. We've actually at TYT, we've We've taken part in a few of those things. So we had um, we had a candidate who unfortunately ended up losing his primary, Brent Welder, in Kansas. That we, through our audience, we raised I don't even know a hundred thousand dollars, one hundred fifty thousand, something crazy like that for him. Um, and people were willing to give it. Like we we just created a like sort of a, a kind of joking online ad attacking Ted Cruz, and we raised twenty thousand dollars to run it in Texas online like a few days or something, which so it's amazing that people are willing to pony up not just their eyeballs, but their actual dollars in pursuit of, you know, in, in, that, in, the, in the particular case of the Ted Cruz thing, maybe not a better world, but it was funny, if nothing else. So I think that the, the willingness to support progressive media monetarily is important, but probably more importantly, I would say the thing that's giving me hope is uh, throughout this election cycle, the sheer number of new candidates especially young, like millennial people running for Congress and state legislatures, uh, especially women and people of color. Like we have had, 
I would say an influx of more dynamic new blood into the Democratic Party. That I don't know how far you have to go back to see something like that. And and some of them obviously taking off, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is, you know, now one of the most watched politicians in the country, even though, you know, six months ago she wouldn't have been able to get on a local radio station. Like, um, so that is certainly a positive thing. And seeing, you know, the the first, you know, major party transgender gubernatorial nominee in Christine Halquist and seeing, you know, Stacey Abrams on the cusp of possibly becoming the first African-American female governor. Like, we're seeing this all over the place, more LGBT representation in candidates and uh, more na- uh, native candidates as well. I think that this is a good thing. I want the Democratic Party to be representative of America, not just in the policies it pursues, but but I also like the representation in terms of the candidates too. I think that's that's important, and I think it's a process that that sort of builds off of itself. I think that after many voters having seen all of these new candidates, I mean, like the idea that Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is not going to inspire other women like her to run, I think is crazy, and so this gives me hope that the next time around. And the next time around, it'll be better and better. And as long as the policies sort of match the promise of the candidates themselves, I think that that should give us a lot of cause for hope, especially in a a time as dark as it is. So, uh, John, I want to wrap up by asking a little bit more about your show, The Damage Report. You mentioned that the overall philosophy behind it is you wake up and you think, all right, what's what, what horrible thing happened now? What's the damage, so to speak? Um, mm-hmm. I'm curious to know a little bit more about how you approach the show. Uh, in, in other words, how does the damage report differ from TYT main show in its content and in its outlook? Well, yeah, uh, as you said, you nailed the the premise, which I, I almost I sort of I I tried to back off of before we launched the show because I was worried that it would be too pessimistic, and I also I I dream of a day when we get Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, or something like that as president, and the premise of the show no longer makes any sense. That's going to be awesome. Uh, for now, it, it does fit every day, and uh, what I try to do is. I try to have a very diverse range of topics. I try to touch base. I have a long list of issues that I try to touch base with at least once a week, if not more. And, you know, that that can be things like, you know, the, the struggle for a higher minimum wage, you know, uh, like contamination in our water, methane emissions, you know, global climate change, terrorism, topics like this. I want to make sure that people are staying abreast of all of these things. It can be overwhelming. And so to some extent, we're sort of self-selecting into a very particular type of audience, the sort of people that can keep up with this day day by day. It is not a sort of mainstream play by any means. Um, But I feel like unless I do keep tabs on these things, I don't know, I feel like that's sort of my way of keeping control in a, a sort of chaotic time in terms of media and news. And I think that there are some people that enjoy that. In terms of differentiation from the main show, I mean, certainly there are, every personality at TYT has topics that they focus on more. Like Anna likes talking about education, uh, the housing market, private prisons, things like that. Uh, Jenk really likes breaking down sort of the day-to-day functioning of, of, of Congress, uh, some of the personalities, money in politics, things like that. Uh, I care about, you know, the environment and, and, and sort of these scientific issues and, you know, a bunch of other things. In terms of the format, um, we... We try every day to have at least one, if not two, uh, guests on. Um, we try to bring people from uh, activism and academia, politicians, scientists, authors, politicians, all, all of those sorts of people. Um, because as, as much respect as I have for my own opinion, I also believe that America has moved too far away from sort of respect for people who make it their lives to, to you know learn about these issues. And so I, I definitely try to inject that sort of expert opinion into the show as much as possible. We do try to we try to cover a lot of different things. I have a sort of stable of co-hosts that come in from day to day, uh, like like Brooke Thomas, who's a journalist who's worked in markets all over the country. Uh, Jer Jackson is, you know, a longtime producer of the main show is a different perspective. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, well, we have fun <laughs> <laughs> well, to the extent that we can. <laughs> One one fun thing about the damage report I notice is uh, is the art for the damage report. How you've got the White House in the be- in the background on fire, 
<laughs> and you've got, oh, excuse me, not the White House. You've got uh, the Capitol uh, mm-hmm. uh, on fire in the background, and uh, and you're looking kind of beat up, you know, in, in the sense of what's the damage. <laughs> and I really look forward to seeing how the art changes once, you know, we get a Sanders or a Warren presidency and the damage starts to get cleaned up. I can't wait to see how the graphics uh, represent <laughs> that instead. Maybe you'll be you'll be you'll be a little less disheveled, hopefully, and so will the country. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, not, not to go kind of dark, but uh, I, you know, I uh, absolutely support Bernie Sanders. He's the most inspirational politician of my life. Um, and, and I do believe that if he were to be president, I think that that is exactly the direction the country needs to go in. But I, I don't think that we necessarily won't need something like the damage report then. I mean, there's the, the tiny bit of worry that like I loved Barack Obama, like during the campaign, in advance of the campaign, back to the, during the 2004 convention with his speech, like I was on board. And then we found that under Barack Obama, TYT did need to keep a critical eye and we needed to criticize him on a lot of different issues. You know, it, Obamacare and uh, didn't you know turn out the way it should have, uh, drone strikes and things like that. There will be things under a Sanders presidency that we will have to check him on. Um, so we are definitely ready for that. But even if he's awesome, even if he's everything that I want him to be, it's still possible that we'll have a Republican Senate. We will definitely have a conservative majority in the Supreme Court. And so you know, no, no matter what amazing thing he or the Democrats are able to pass, it is going to be challenged day after day uh, in the states all the way to the Supreme Court. So like what we need now is a president like Sanders, if not Sanders himself. Um, but the struggle is very much going to remain, even if we get to that amazing day. Well, I definitely appreciate your uh, willingness to do that important work and, and your continued efforts in doing that even right now. So that brings us to the end of our questions. Thanks so much, John Iadarola. It's been a fun and thought-provoking discussion. Oh, thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. You guys are awesome. Thanks a lot. We'd like to thank Jamie Willard for providing background music. You can find more of his music on YouTube. We'd also like to thank Adam Schultz for the Pineal Express logo. If you like Pineal Express, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash pinealexpress and consider pledging your support in exchange for patron rewards, including extra show episodes and content. If you can't pledge your support, please consider giving us a positive rating and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to our patrons at the Conscious Conductor level of support. Patrons like you, Tara Lee, Harris Hajiabdij, and Megan Ryan helped to keep Pineal Express running.